Hey everyone, welcome to the Beyond Extent podcast, a podcast dedicated to a chat between two environment artists discussing everything about the industry we work in. I'm Timothy and I'm joined by William, who is a friend and fellow colleague of mine. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to take a deep dive into switching programs. Going from our own experiences when moving through the industry, to recommendations for people that are still fresh to it all. This was another fun one for us, and we also think it will be one for you too. Hey, William! Welcome back to episode 10. Damn, number 10 already, huh? Yeah, time's flying, man. I was uh, was looking through the list, and it's already number 10, apparently. So uh, Sweet. Doing good, man. Doing good. Awesome. How are you yeah. doing? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing all right. But, but like you said, time is flying. It's crazy. Like, these last two weeks for me have felt like, I don't know, half a week. It's, it's pretty crazy <laughs> for me. Yeah, late, lately, I mean, I guess that's a good thing, right? Isn't that what they say? Like, when time passes quickly you, you're having fun or something mm -hmm. well yeah like uh it just it just means that you're busy right like you're doing a lot of stuff probably having a lot yeah. of funny yeah. games like it's good yeah i mean that's what it's been for me yeah it's been working and uh and playing stuff and mm -hmm. then yeah time's been time's been pretty quick yeah i've been noticing the same thing like i noticed that in the beginning of the week i'm always like oh I don't really want to go to work this week. I just want to work on personal projects or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then before I realize it, it's already like Friday. Right. And it's like, okay, that's another week done. Yeah, that that, that is crazy. It, 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 like you said, yeah, it's, it's, it's really, wait, what? It's Thursday already? <laughs> but yeah, I also took, I took two days off in like a week. Just so, I don't know. Right now I kind of feel like I need a little... A little bit more time you know but it's so we had so many days off in like may right because that's i think in, in germany it's definitely the biggest month of like just having like a day off here and a day off there and you just have like three long weekends in a row oh yeah that's true yeah, yeah yeah and and i think now we won't have any days off until like christmas mm -hmm. so we had like five or six weeks of having like normal five day weeks so I'm yeah I'm 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 thinking I'll just. It take. always makes me so sad when you bring that up. <laughs> right? Yeah. And uh, the thing is, the thing is, I kind of gave up on like because I I was saving some of my uh, days for you know maybe going to Spain at some point. Mm -hmm. But like I think didn't they open the borders? I think you could I could go to Spain now. I think so. Yeah. I, yeah, but I still you know I don't think I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna do it this year. I think I'm just gonna. Yeah we've Take been my time yeah we've been talking about the same thing like going going back to belgium and it's just like uh we, we're currently thinking about if it's really worth it sitting on a plane mm. where we don't really know what the safety precautions are or i don't know man it's just an awkward feeling sitting in like a giant metal tube with like 100 other people like, yeah and and all the air i mean if if someone has it you're gonna get it right because they circulate the air all the way around yeah yeah well they it's like when someone someone farts on the airplane <laughs> you'll eventually smell it <laughs> well they filter all the particles i don't know about the smell <laughs> yeah me neither man but it's 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 like yesterday i went to dinner with my dad and it's uh it's already like it the, the restaurant is just normal like it, it there's no masks there's a little bit more like space i would say between the tables but it doesn't seem like there's any like safety precautions anymore mm -hmm. well it it kind of also makes somewhat sense right because we don't uh we don't really have that many open cases anymore compared to other countries right so at a certain point we need to open open up things at least that's yeah. how I feel because, like, if you if you compare it if you compare it to other diseases, like, there's always a chance that you're gonna get it, right? Like Fair. that's yeah, that's that's just how I feel. Like, uh, maybe it should be a little bit more targeted towards the people that are in risk groups and all that stuff. But mm. yeah, I don't know, man. 
It's so it's so hard to. I mean, it's literally like nobody's ever dealt with this, right? Nobody yeah. that's alive. So yeah, exactly. It's, it's really hard to tell. Yeah, there is um, like uh, I've I've not been going out right like too much. Uh, yeah, we do yeah. we do the occasional walk here and there, but I've been um with the, with all that time that I save now, well, save technically, I've been diving back into into my personal work, and uh. I've I've made the time like all all the stuff with the with the website is over and like all the structures are in place. So I'm I'm finding more and more time to to work on personal work again. Right. And it made me think because some other people were talking in, in the community about like oh how to switch programs and when to switch programs and what is a good way of switching and should you experiment. That uh, it made me think about like the time that I switch programs. Like, mm. um, as a student, I started with 3ds Max, and right. like I went through four years of uni, like only using Max. Um, well, as a main modeling package, like I use ZBrush and all that stuff too. Of course, but yeah, as soon as I hit the workforce, so to say, like as soon as I got my my internship, um, they basically requested me to switch over to Maya. Right. So it would kind of be interesting to dive into like um, when to switch programs and how to switch programs. Like, have you dealt with that stuff before? So, as as per usual, I have a pretty strong opinion about this. Actually, oh god. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I at my at my old job um, um, when I was at the outsourcing company. Uh, of course, it's it's a whole different thing because you you need to adapt to what what the client's needs are so that either means working in whatever they say or working in whatever you want to and then in the end exporting it to whatever they like and then like doing the whole exporting process like or setting it up for the engine in that software yeah and i yeah. had to do that with uh with maya because i'm I, I also started with max um and uh i'm still a max user mm -hmm. um and and there i had to 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 do some maya which was annoying at first but then you know you just realize that it's all the same stuff the buttons are just somewhere else and they're called something else yeah yeah um and um and yeah so that was like i didn't have to fully switch over to something yet but i've had to dabble in it here and there mm -hmm. um so how, yeah, how just... does that work like um say say you get a client and they request the the stuff to set up in maya yeah so you will be responsible for just like learning enough Maya to set it up in there? Exactly. So that's that's pretty much what I did. So what I would do is I would model all my stuff in Max, then plop it over to Maya and then do stuff like um like finishing up the UVs or doing like all the scripts that they had to do let's say like face weighted normals, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I would do that in in in, in Maya and I would have to in case there's any like changes because then you already have it inside Maya you, you would have to then say I don't know change the UVs a little bit or or do some small changes to the mesh so I was I, I can definitely do a little bit of modeling in it but it would just take me ages to make like a nice high poly fully in Maya yeah, yeah. so that's why I decided to do it at max and then just plop it in Maya at the end Mm -hmm. But yeah, so so I I know the basics, you know, of how how to do that stuff, and I know some scripts that they use. But it's it's not like I could just uh, like dish out a really nice three D model as quickly as I would be able to in, in Max. Yeah, was that was that the same for texturing too, or was it just purely three D? Um, texturing, um, it was just substance all day, right? So yeah, it didn't really. Really yeah, because um, like when I was working at Frontier, um, we started out with um, Quixel, like Dedu. Oh, right. And then I still remember like saving all the source files for that, which was uh, it was a <laughs> was a hassle. Yeah. And at a certain point, I was just like, okay, this is such a wasted time because we were creating all the materials over and over. We didn't have a dedicated material artist either. So we're oh, just... and you didn't have a database of like stuff that you could just reuse? No, exactly. So at a certain point, I I delved into that stuff and I was like, okay, how can I use Dedu to set up a database of materials to to save on a server and then people can just download the stuff that they need. But 
it was such a hassle to get that working. I spent like um like a couple of weeks like working on it on and off. And I couldn't I couldn't get it to work because I would save my project and I would save the material and it would look good. I would put it on well, I would save it directly onto the server. But there's some weird connection that happens between the two, or how the server was set up or whatever, that it it couldn't read it as soon as you opened it back up. So we we could never um set up that database of materials which was really weird but that then sucks. i didn't know that that wasn't the that wasn't the, like i thought that was a feature that they had but i guess not well the feature was there technically so it might not be might not be their fault uh it could it could also be like an internal it structure thing that that just prohibited correct saving or whatever or it wouldn't save like specific files that could have been it too but mm. um yeah we we could never get it get it to work, but uh, yeah. So I I started out with with that sort of texturing, and then on the next project we we switched over to substance because we got dedicated material artists from um, right. Gorilla closing a studio in Cambridge, and mm. we had two texture artists come over and they basically built like the whole pipeline for us. Nice. So that was that was really nice, but it just. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's another time when you just have to switch on the fly, and it's just like, oh yeah, we're using uh, we were using Dido before, but now it's Substance, right? Um, and I spend uh, I spend a lot of my time just learning new programs when on on personal work, which is like, yeah, when when Substance came out, I was like, oh, I'll I'll do something with Substance then. I'll just try to incorporate it in a way so that I get like a basic level understanding of the program. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean that that, that makes sense. Um so what I was uh, what I was saying earlier with my uh, with my strong opinion that I have, um with my hot take, um it's I always try to work forward. In in, in and I'm going to explain what that means. So working forward means learning new stuff so um if you're if you're let's say i'm i'm pretty good with max i'm pretty good with zbrush i'm pretty good with substance painter but i'm not that great with substance designer i haven't really touched houdini yet i'm pretty basic and like marvelous designer right that's mm -hmm. kind of what where i am right now and so working forward for me would mean learning substance more substance designer more or learning uh, like looking into houdini but what I don't want to do is work sideways, which yeah. means I learn stuff that I can already do, but I do it in a different software. So for me right now, I don't see a point in learning Maya or learning Blender because I can already do all that stuff in Max, mm -hmm. right? So I would rather learn something that I don't know how to do, like let's say make a cool like uh, random generated thing in, in, in Houdini, which I don't have any idea how to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, instead of learning how to box model or sculpt all over again in a different software, so that that's kind of how I feel. I mean, of course, there's reasons that that would make sense why you should work sideways. Like, a friend of mine just also started at a new studio and he has to learn Maya now instead of Max. Like, like you said, that can be one of the things, or it could be that you're deciding, oh, I this next project that I want to make. I want to put it on the asset store, so I need to do it in Blender, so I don't need to pay. Like I don't need to mm -hmm. uh, pay for the commercial license for like uh, Maya or Max, right? And um, but if if there's no like pressure for that, I don't see a reason to just switch because you think the other the other software is is cooler or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Because they're all kind of the same. Like if you're in Max Maya or, or Blender, like they're all pretty much the same. They can all do the same things. Some do some of it better than others. But mm -hmm. just the time that you have with it and the experience you have with it means that you are definitely going to be quicker, at least at first. And um, I mean, yeah, it, it depends. So th th usually if, you, if you're switching software, and you maybe you take some of your shortcuts and whatever and... and uh, and you can actually learn and you suffer pretty easily. But I think that maybe that time would be better invested in learning something completely new, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah, for sure, man. I don't think I don't think even that's a hot take. It's just it's just logical at some <laughs> nah, point. It's just, just, yeah, I just <laughs> it's just 
uh, an optimized way of looking at it, right? Because yeah. like um you you mentioned that um there there are some commercial benefits of switching programs too. And of course. you brought up the, the the switching to Blender because that's basically my case, right? Right. Like uh, I was looking into how I could make money with the stuff that I do on in personal work. And then mm -hmm. I was looking into licenses and I paid for Maya LT for a little bit. Um, and I finished one project within that. And then I was just looking at like, okay, so I spent like, what, what is it? Like 30 euros a month for Maya LT, mm. which is like an okay deal if you're doing like um, freelance or, or anything like that or anything right. on a recurring basis. But I was just starting out. So I was just like, look, if I'm going to spend like 30 euros a month and then not do anything with it with that month, it would put like additional pressure on me. Yeah. So I was like, look, I'm just going to switch to Blender. I'll just make it work. It's free. I can do everything that I want and just get rid of all these stupid barriers of like having to pay this, having to pay that. Right. And it it was like the perfect time, right? Because like 2.8 just came out and it looked really awesome compared to um compared to the previous editions of Blender itself. Right. And yeah, they, I mean they, that's that's when it all started, right? Yeah, because they were they had a long period where it were it was just like an ugly program to look at and it was not not pleasing to the eye and it's not industry standard and they were changing all that stuff up and that all came in like 2.8. So it was like the the perfect storm basically. Yeah. Um but yeah. Like I think I think it would be interesting just to talk about how you would deal with it if you were a student. Because I think all the points that we made are really good to adhere to, but we're coming from a position where we have no dedicated timeline, right? Yeah. So say say you're a student, you know um you know Max, but you're not really that advanced in modeling yet. And you're already thinking about switching to Blender because maybe the university is using that as their main modeling package would you would you switch or would you just stick with max right now until you get to university and then switch i think if you're not at a point yet where you where you would say that you're comfortable with max and just like already like quick like you have all your all your um, hotkeys and everything set up and you're like you can you can pump out a, a, a good like nice high poly model like really quickly then i think it might still be worth it to switch because down like i think now blender is gonna become more important in the industry and even if it's not it's like you can still say hey let me work with blender and then export it to wherever Mm -hmm. like to to max and then use all your scripts there to export it to the engine yeah and they can't really say anything against it because in the end you're going to be quicker and you're not going to cost any extra licensing fees mm -hmm. right so and, and in general if you're thinking about getting into 3d right now i would probably tell you yeah just use blender because yeah. it's good and it's free but I don't like back then. I don't think that was really the best option. No, no, no. But but well, by now it might. I think it might be. It's kind of weird, right? Because I do feel like that is a good option. But I do think that there is like this disconnect between what is happening in the the studios and what's happening in university. Because at this True. point, university is still figuring it out like if they should switch to Blender or if they should just keep it to to Maya and Max. Yeah. <clears throat> because if if you're you're gonna become a student in like a year, you're like enrolled in a program and you're gonna start in like, I don't know, a couple of months, say. But they tell you that you have to use Maya. Like you don't have another option, right? Yeah, so I guess not. that's that's where that's where it gets kind of tricky because I find it kind of stupid to just restrict all the students to like one program and then they'll have to switch it up anyway after those four years because in those four years like stuff is going to change a lot yeah like uh what, what we're seeing in the industry right now uh at least from my perspective is that a lot of studios are 
already moving away of or have moved away from the traditional pipeline they're they're trying to make it um program agnostic where like uh like for us like in in our studio like we can we can basically model with all the stuff that we want like that's totally up to you as long as you get it into like an fbx format and you can get it into max yeah like the other stuff doesn't matter like the end result is going to be the same and depending on what your skills are like i'm i'm really quick with blender like even quicker than i was with maya in the beginning nice so it's uh well not the beginning but like at the end when i stopped using maya right, right but it's like yeah why wouldn't that be a benefit for the company right is it, yeah exactly and if it if it's not like okay we only have max licenses so we, we you can't work in maya you can still work in blender because it's free i mean that that is that does definitely gives you a lot of freedom and that's why i would say if you are starting now just start blender because then you can also like you said, you could potentially even just like sell your personal stuff if you've got a substance and a ZBrush license or whatever, mm -hmm. which which is definitely compared to what max cost is pretty cheap. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. I think what is substance like 20 bucks a month and then ZBrush is like one payment of 700 bucks. Yeah. Something like that, which is a lot of money, but like compared to like, what is it paying 300 a month? It's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's only... <sighs> It only comes into play when you're doing commercial stuff anyway. So at that point, you should already have like a bit of money or like should already be working for money. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, if you look at the overall package, you, you get like substance. I have the, what's it called? The perpetual license still. So, oh, so you can't get the updates? Um. So I can't get the updates, but I don't need it. Right because i'm i'm familiar with all the stuff that i need now and if i see something that's worth updating for i'll i'll just update whenever i want but currently there's not really anything that's looking uh like a move upwards like you said like everything they're expanding their base but it's not like the next revolution in like texturing at the moment yeah that's true i i would say there's a lot of like quality of life improvements mm-hmm because I, I, I also like I bought substance back in the day when it when that was the, the like the. Oh, Jesus Christ! I can't talk anymore. <laughs> when that was like the 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 way they were doing it, right? They were just selling it for like 150 bucks or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, and now they switched to that uh, subscription style, and I am actually subscribed uh, because. I like the stuff that they added. I like um, all, uh, like the, whatever the. I mean, I also don't know which which perpetual version you have because mine was like 2016 version or something. Oh was, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm still on yeah. like 2019 or something. Like I have okay, a, yeah. I have a okay, so you have version. all the anchor points and everything in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because that that was like a big thing, I would say. Yeah. So yeah, then then it's probably then it's probably true. You don't need like the newest version all the time, but because for me it was like yeah, I don't want to I don't want to use like Substance Painter two point something. I want to get the new stuff mm -hmm. but yeah that's the thing if you have a good base of softwares then you're you probably don't need to yeah need to have all the all the newest ones all the time yeah exactly like it, it comes it comes down to the point that you brought up right like look at the stuff that can enhance your work instead of like replace something that you're already doing yeah because like um if you if you have no concerns whatsoever and you're just looking to switch to blender for for the sake of switching to blender because it's coming up like that might not be worthwhile like if the other program yeah. is doing what you're doing already then why would you switch yeah but then like yeah exactly like rather spend that time looking at houdini let's say because that's yeah, exactly that's i think also going to be a lot more important in the future and um i haven't even fucking uh, opened it once so yeah, I yeah. I dabbled in it a bit, but it's a it's a steep learning curve, man. Like, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's I always look back at like uh, like students, right? Like, I wasn't really concerned about like switching programs all the time. I I really just focused on um, one program that that i knew that worked it was like 3ds max back then 
And I was just like, okay, I'll just model this and I'll model the next thing and I'll just have fun with the program and try to learn it in a really fun way. Right. Um, especially because you're, you're still so young at that point. I mean, we're still young, so. <laughs> but it's like you're, you're 18 and you're just... You want to you wanna experience some new things, right? So, um, where was I going? Like, it's it's really it's really easy to get distracted by, like, all the shiny new things. Right. But sometimes it's just worth, like, sitting down, like, taking, taking I don't know, Max or Blender or, or Maya and just pick that one thing and just go with it and use it to your best of your abilities until you have to switch for um for like commercial reasons or the the studio is bringing it up that you need to have this this program knowledge like that's that's a moment when you would switch i wouldn't i wouldn't right. switch any other way yeah makes sense to me man yeah it's it's a tricky one because i i keep thinking back at like the example which is coming from uh, our community, by the way. Like uh, it's coming from Antonio, and he's currently, he's currently a student. Well, he's he's gonna become a student fairly soon, and he got a recommendation from the university to either start Maya or Blender. But the the, the school itself isn't sure yet what they're gonna use. So, what? I would I would say in that that specific case. It doesn't really matter that much which you which program you use. It's more about the underlying uh, modeling techniques, right? Like knowing how to bevel, knowing how to model shapes. That is that is something that translates between programs. It doesn't even yeah. matter which one you use. Like so, if you focus on those fundamentals, like um, getting getting the base shapes right, working on topology, like knowing knowing how to model stuff. Um, knowing how to get there quick, like all the tools are going to be there in the other program. They're just going to be called differently or they have different hotkeys and yeah. like switching shouldn't take you that long. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think in that particular situation, I would probably tell him to, uh, to go for Blender because mm. like I said, I think in the future, it's going to get more uh, important and it's free and it gives you a lot of freedom yeah um but but yeah if it, if it um yeah if you're like yeah i mean exactly what you said that, that's 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 it right like that's the whole point we were making is if you don't have a reason to switch don't switch but if you're just starting out then probably think about all the different advantages and disadvantages and i would say right now blender is probably the one with the biggest advantage because mm -hmm. You have to look at what's outside of the modeling package because inside they're all the same. You know, I mean, of course, I I like the modifiers in Max. Uh, I also like uh, the way they do the UV. Like you can always have the UV window open in Maya. That's pretty cool. Yep. So, but in the end, whatever, it doesn't really matter. Um, what matters is the stuff around it, which is it free? Does it allow you to do this? Does it allow you to do that? You know, like, is it is it complicated to make scripts for, let's mm. say, right? If you want to do that. So, and, or how many scripts are out there for this? Yeah. yeah. Um, and if, and... if you're looking at those uh, parameters, like if you just look at Blender, like Blender is, is just a powerhouse when it comes to that stuff. Yeah. Like if you look at the available add-ons, if you look at the stuff that's in progress, like what they're working on for the future, Hmm. Like uh, just the sculpting in that program, like it, I'm pretty sure that it could at one point just replace ZBrush. Jesus Christ, yeah, that would be crazy. So if you have a program that does all that stuff, like it's it's like you said, like it's it's the biggest investment that you could have um, for for the long term future. Like right. at some point, like. Uh, like you seen, you seen all the investments from like uh, the big studios in games too. Like they're all they're all invested in Blender themselves, so it's gonna be a big deal. Like, yeah. and I mean, I'm already using it right now, so <laughs> that's how. Should I should I get paid by Blender for this? By the way, <laughs> I mean, if if you're gonna get paid, I think I should get paid as well. That's my only. That's all I'm gonna say about it. <laughs> 
Um, is um, so now now that we just uh, like kiss Blender's ass for a while. Is there is there still Blender game engine? No, they completely scrapped that. Okay, I was gonna say because if there is, then I don't know what the fuck they're doing. Because <laughs> yeah. that was that was a shit show. Yeah, that needed to go. Like <laughs> that, yeah, that, 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 that needed to go. Yeah, that's 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 exactly right. But yeah, man, like um, uh, <laughs> yeah, just keep thinking back at my experience with it, and I was like, ooh, the fuck is this? Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> But like, if you look at the renderer now, like uh, jumping from point to point, like Eevee is such yeah. a good renderer, man. It makes everything look so nice from the beginning. It's like I I kind of compare it to Unreal. Like it's Damn. such a it's such a it's a nice package to start out with. Like it's very pleasing as an artist to work in uh, a package that presents you with nice stuff from the get go, right? Of course. Yeah, yeah, like you don't have that feeling with Unity. You can make stuff look as good or even better in some cases than Unreal would and vice versa. But it's just like from from like a, a purely artist perspective, if you open up something like that, it's just so pleasing to work in. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, we were just talking about this earlier that I've been playing Escape from Tarkov, right? Which is in Unity. Um, oh, really? I didn't even know that. Yeah, and it looks it looks pretty pretty good. I mean, of course, there's some stuff that you know, I mean it's always going to be, but it it looks really good. Um, and but but yeah, I don't think it's. Uh, I think what is it like? Programmers like Unity, but artists like Unreal. Isn't that kind of how it goes? Yeah, probably. If we're if we're going to yeah. generalize, that's probably the best way to do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and because uh, yeah, it's just Unreal is just you have. As an artist, you have so many tools. It's so quick. It's so nice. But yeah, from my like, I haven't touched Unity in a while. But from what I remember, uh, <laughs> nah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel the same way. Like it's, it's not. I'm so used to Unreal. Like it's not. It's not. Um, <sighs> it's as like simple. home, man. Sorry. It's like home. I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I feel the same way, man. Like, uh, it, it's so tricky to set something really simple up in an, in Unity for me. Like, some, some people are magicians, but it's like, that's the thing. Like, uh, with all this stuff that we talked about today, like, they're all just tools. Yeah. Like, pick the tool that you like. Pick the tool that's best for the job. Like, uh, and just stick with it. Exactly. Like some people still use like Blender from from I don't know the nineties or whatever. Like it doesn't matter if their stuff looks good, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean that that is that's the thing. It's Blender, Max, and Maya. What they are, they are different toolboxes. And you have a hammer and you have a screwdriver, but it's it might be in a different compartment. You know, it might have a different little tag on it you don't know exactly mm -hmm. oh what is this called over here it's this is called a bevel hammer oh and this is called a chamfer hammer you know <laughs> like it's the same thing it's, it's just called a differently. Good <laughs> it's in a different part of the toolbox you know you might have to you might have to rummage around a little bit longer to find it but in the end it's gonna nail and nail into the wall same way right yeah yeah exactly man i'm good at analogies huh <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you're gonna use the chamfer hammer to nail the nail into a wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that that kind of fell apart at some point. <laughs> but you know what I mean. <laughs> but it still sticks. It still sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's it's just it's it, it is exactly that. Like, uh, yeah. Don't especially if you're a student. Like, just don't worry about it too much. Just try to have fun. Like. You're going to be worrying about a whole lot of other stuff once you start getting into the industry. So have fun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Try having fun. Try having fun before it all goes away. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> we still have fun, though. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Oh, you still have fun? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, you know, we kid, we kid. Yeah. No, it's, um, but yeah, that's the thing. As, as long as you still have a choice... You know, definitely think about which choice you want to make and then try to stick to it and not try to, like, flip-flop around 
like, oh, today I'm going to use Mono, tomorrow I'm going to use Blender, and the next Tuesday I'm going to start with Maya. Like, that doesn't make any sense. If you don't know how to model in one software yet, then don't try to start in a different one. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, because, like, uh, we brought it up before, but, like, if you if you know how to do stuff in one program, it's going to translate to the other one. Yes, it's 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 going to be a lot faster to learn something else as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Like, um, for me personally... When I switched from uh, Maya to Blender, like, it was so fluent. Like, uh, obviously, like, I spent, like, a, a couple of weeks, like, uh, or, like, two weeks, I think, like, fumbling over all the hotkeys and, like, trying to set up, like, pie menus like I did in Maya. Hmm. And um, I think the thing that I did wrong was trying to force Blender into the mold of Maya. Right, so I, yes. So yes. I just had to get rid of that notion and just be like, look, what is Blender doing here that I can pick up? And then I just, instead of using like the Maya controls, I just completely reverted everything and just tried to get used to like all the Blender uh, controls. Because right. it would be it would be such a hassle for me to look stuff up in Blender and like, oh, how do I do this? And then it's like, oh, it's this hotkey. But then all the hotkeys changed because I was using the Maya preset. So it's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, now I need to scrounge through like all the hotkeys and see what that thing is at. Like I just made it so much worse for myself that I was just like, yeah. okay, I'm just going to start from scratch, learn Blender, how it's intended to be used and just deal with it. Right. I mean, I have a great, I have another great analogy that I just thought of. Oh, go for it, man. So... When you're learning to drive a car, you should first become comfortable in that exact car, you know, until you can drive really well. And then if you're really comfortable with that car, then maybe you can switch to another car. It might still, you know, it's still going to do the same thing. It's still going to drive and do this, but maybe the, the, ga the gas pedal somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> with the gas pedals on the back seat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, you know, and uh, I don't know, the, the stick shift is, is a little bit, you know, the numbers are re reversed. <laughs> so, you know, but you should first become comfortable in that one thing so you have all that muscle memory and you don't uh, crash. And uh, yeah, no, I don't know, it fell apart again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I thought I was onto something, but then it just fell apart at the end. I was about to say like, oh, yeah, it's going to fall apart, but I, I would just... I was just waiting for you to say it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, you know, do one the, the yeah, do the thing that I said. Well, it's okay. I'm go, I'm going to try to help you out with that analogy. <laughs> it's basically driving Please. the car in the UK versus driving it on in Europe. Oh, because it's it's just like you have to do things differently, but like everything is still in the same place. Yeah, it still translates. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Nah, yeah, it still maybe. falls apart. And it kind of does, but I think it's, it's definitely better than what I was trying to do. <laughs> yeah, give us give us like a couple of podcast episodes and we'll get it right, people. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll just be all day with a pen in my little in my little room trying to figure out analogies and, and metaphors. <laughs> Gotta be like a math equation. Blender equals hammer. Max equals screwdriver, you know, and then Maya equals car. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Houdini is just a, a spaceship. Oh well, yeah. yeah. If we're going, if we're going with those comparisons, yeah. For for me specifically, like Houdini at the moment is just like yeah, the ISS space station for, or whatever. Like, for 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 another for another day, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'll save. I'll save it. <laughs> There's no, there's no point in doing this right now. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I really want to look into it, but then, I don't know. You know, it's it's gonna be hard. <laughs> yeah, it's, it is, and I think the reason why it's so hard because it's uh, fundamentally different, right? Like, yeah, it's you have it, to change your whole way of thinking. Yeah, it's I, I see, I see that. So so you have like normal texturing with like painter and then you have mm. substance designer which dives into like the whole proceduralness of it. Yes. So you kind of have that jump between the two but it didn't it doesn't feel as big because texturing is just like 
how should I say it? Like, it's just one part. Well, of I it. can tell you exactly why. Because you add a third coordinate, you add a, a third dimension. Mm. And yeah. that makes a huge difference. Yeah, that's true. Because if you're if you're moving from normal texturing to to procedural texturing, procedural texturing, you're just thinking about like that little square that you have, right? A mm -hmm. little square with the texture, and you're like, okay, uh, I need to plug in this shape, and then I can morph it, I warp it like this, and do a little thing, whatever, in here. But it's all just in the end, what you're what you're changing is pixels, which are two dimensional. Yeah. But then in Odini, you to this learning process which already i mean you know it's it's still it's you still got to learn substance designer it's not like that it's, it comes naturally mm -hmm. um especially if you've never like done node-based stuff before yeah, yeah but then moving to to uh houdini it's that same thing but you also you're, you're doing it in vertices instead of pixels and in three dimensions instead of two and it's it's just, yeah, it's and so it's, complex. And it's also like, if you want to build something, if you want to build like a, I don't know, like a, a modular house generator or whatever, like hmm. you can't just get by with like the simple nodes that the program gives you. You have to dig into like actual code. And that's, that's where it kind of falls apart for me. Yeah. yeah. Just like my metaphors. It's, um, <laughs> that's where I, that's where I'm like, you know, some other time. Yeah. It's it's still on the list, like it's still on the to do list, but it's of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, maybe another day. Um, let's switch it up, man. Let's uh, let's have a look at one of the questions. Sure. Um, Any metaphors that anyone needs? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> um, dun -dun -dun. So I haven't I haven't prepped any any of these. Um, <laughs> Oh, this might actually be a good one to dive into. Like, this is from uh, Geo. What is the main focus for environment artists with all these new programs? And do I need to shift to these? Or do I still focus on the old pipeline? And I think by by old pipeline, we can, we can probably define it as uh, modeling package, substance, and then game engine, right? Right. That's probably the, the, the old pipeline, quote unquote. Yeah. Um, and I think with the new programs, what he's what he's alluding to is like we we just mentioned like Houdini. Um, I think Houdini might be the biggest one actually. Can you name another yeah. big one that is that is on the horizon? Good question. I mean, that's that's what, what I would say. That's probably the biggest one. That's like because it breaks everything else right because it's so different yeah i guess what 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 would kind of be new with something i mean it's not that new it's like something like marvelous designer because mm. it means that you don't have to sculpt cloth anymore but you can simulate it right i mean yeah but that that just replaces like a tiny fraction of the work right it's not going to exactly. fundamentally change like what we do as environment artists yeah 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 yeah, so um, what do you think about this? So I'll just repeat the question. So do I need to shift to these new programs or do I still focus on the old pipeline? Hmm. Oh, another thing that I just thought of um, for new pipeline uh -huh. is uh, photogrammetry, obviously. That's a big yeah. one. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, but I, I would still say, so if you're trying to get into the industry now, the, so you have to think about inertia, right? Big studios, especially, they have so much, so many people, and they have so much invested into their workflow, right? They have the documentation, they have all the scripts, everything, all the tools, and they've got thousands of people that work like this. So to change that, it's going to take a lot more time, right? And that means that even if there is, is all this new software and there is all these new things, there is... Like there's still gonna be people modeling and texturing and like 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 old school style or whatever mm -hmm. it's called it right in in a couple of years and then maybe you know it's gonna start of course photogrammetry something like that becomes more important Houdini all all these things but they're gonna be before replacing anything it's gonna be kind of how it is now they're gonna blend into the normal workflow and they'll support it rather than replacing it 
Yeah, yeah. And then maybe at some point they will, but I think for now, just you know, it, it, I, th I think it's not gonna. It's gonna change, but it's gonna gradually change, and not from like one day to the other. Yeah, the thing that I think, um, especially when talking about Houdini, is that at a certain point it's gonna be the same as you would see people uh, texturing an environment using pre-built textures by the by the texture artist. What I what I mean by that is that um, I don't think a lot of environment artists are gonna be in contact with Houdini itself but more about what it spits out or what is built by yes. the Houdini artist. It's like, oh, yes. we need we need these buildings. Like I can I can go through the parameters and like change it up if I want to, but you're not going to be the people in contact with the underlying uh the underlying structure within Houdini itself is going to be fairly small. Yeah. So I think it might be something like that and that is that, that yeah that's that's what i was kind of saying with it's gonna it's gonna support it and play in uh, instead of replacing it right because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's that's how it's used right now we have a couple guys that are really smart and they have big brains and they do all the houdini stuff for the the rest of us stupid people yeah exactly and uh and i love them yeah, for it. <laughs> yeah exactly and then they they make it so we don't have to do all the boring stuff mm-hmm we don't yeah. have to play stuff by hand it gets it gets placed for us exactly it's gonna uh i don't know who brought up this point but it's like it's gonna it's gonna replace like all the in our cases like as as level artists um uh a lot of the time in my case specifically it's gonna replace like all the generic set dressing and then if yes. we want to do like the environmental storytelling and we want to infuse it with our own stories, that's where we as artists still come in and do that work. Yeah, but, I mean, that's that's the thing. That's exactly what it is, right? You you get rid of the boring stuff and you get actually, you, you'll end up actually being able to be more creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, exactly. Yeah, like the grunt work's already done. Mm-hmm. So to come back to the question, like, would you say that people still focus on the old pipeline? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean the I mean, same way. Like currently, like I imagine, imagine this, like you're a student, you just got in uni and you have like a three to four year course. Uh -huh. I would expect that most courses these days already have like at least one module that touches Houdini. Like I've seen it from the school that oh, I went really? to where, where they already teach you like the, the basics of Houdini and you have to procedurally create some, some assets. So they're already doing that. Um, what? but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. Like seeing the stuff come that, out. <laughs> yeah. Cause at the school that I was at, no, 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 they're not doing that anytime soon. I don't think. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's like you said, like the old, uh, the old stuff quote unquote, is still going to be relevant. Like there's always going to be people that, that do that kind of work. And even if it's not for AAA, like a look at, uh, indie studios where there's like a lot of hand painted stuff involved and there's a lot of, um, stylized stuff involved too. That you can't scan. Yeah. Yeah. Also, yeah, that, that would be another good topic to talk about because I have, uh, no experience with photogrammetry myself, like at all. Um, no, me, me neither. We had we had one guy that did most of the photogrammetry at uh, Elite 3D, and he had his little tent, mm -hmm. and that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I think but I, I have I've never done it myself. I think that's that's also one of those cases where unless, like, photogrammetry is always working in tandem with what we already create, unless you're yeah. going for like a look where everything is photogrammetry. Like that's where yeah. you would obviously need photogrammetry experience, but yeah, I don't see I don't see a game. Uh, how to say it? Like I don't see a game only using photogrammetry. There's always going to be someone involved with like blending between the assets or like still creating like ground textures because they can't get the look right with the photogrammetry that they got. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's always going to be stuff like that. So I agree, and like you said, especially with stylized stuff, you can't scan that, or even stuff like sci-fi, you can't scan sci-fi stuff because they're 
you know they're, they don't exist mm -hmm. and um even medieval stuff i mean i guess you can scan a medieval castle but it's going to be in ruins so it's not going to really you know yeah, yeah. you're not going to be able you to can... make it a, make a cool game out of it yeah exactly yeah, like, you can take the parts and then you still need an artist to create like the final piece yeah yeah exactly so yeah currently i don't think you need to shift any of it like still keep focused on the old pipeline um you're going to get hired for that anyway. Like all the experience that you can add on top of that is going to be good. But you should also link it to your personal interests. Because you don't want to be... Say say in my case, like I don't really like photogrammetry. Like I, I never had like the the interest to explore it even. Like I want to, I want to explore other stuff. So say, say I dive head, head deep into that topic... And then I get hired for a studio that wants me to do photogrammetry. You're going to be stuck in a job that you don't really want to do. Yeah. That's that's a big thing. Like, don't just do something because you think you need to do it. Because in the end, yeah, like you said, if you're, if you're going to be like, okay, I'm going to become a technical artist because that's the easiest way to get a job. You know? Like, because they're, they're really, like, sought after. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you realize, well, they're probably sought after because this is really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and not a lot of people can do it. And I don't really want to put the time and effort in it because I don't like, I don't know, maybe I don't enjoy it as much. Then maybe just don't become a technical artist and rather do something for the rest of your life that you're going to have some more fun with. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think that's, that's also, uh, of what I try to do with my portfolio specifically. I was like, I have all my personal work in the foreground and the focus is always on creating complete environments instead of creating props. So like there's, there's nothing else involved with that. I don't like props. Well, I, that's the thing. Like I do like creating props, but I want to work on like the bigger picture. I don't mm. want to work on like one prop and then move on to the next prop and then the next prop. I want to have variation in my work. I want to talk about like environmental storytelling and then I want to talk about like the design of the space and then I want to zoom out and think about the composition. I want to do all that kind of stuff and that's how I uh, created my portfolio too to show that off. Right. Yeah. But yeah. Always going forward. Exactly. Yeah. Just do what you love, people. Keep focused on that. I mean, that's why we're in this industry, right? Hell yeah. Probably for most people. I don't think a lot of people get into the industry for the money or for... Well, I can I tell you, know. it's definitely not for the money, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, this is, a, this is a good question to round off on. Like, um, I hope this answers it. I think, um, I think so. I think Should so, be. yeah. It's always interesting so. to dive into... Uh, the broader topics when it comes to those those uh, questions. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the podcast. If you did, then you can check out the playlist on the right for more episodes and don't forget to like, subscribe or share it with friends. If you're an environment artist trying to break into the industry or just looking to grow your skills, you can find a ton more resources like weekly tips, blog posts and more on beyondextend.com. But that's going to do it from our side. Thanks so much for joining us. And a shout out to all of our Patreon supporters who made this possible.